Hello everyone and welcome back to Dragalia Foundry. For today's video we're going to be taking a quick look at what's ahead for Dragalia Lost Part 4. This came out today and a couple of you had been predicting that we'd get this news fairly soon and I think it makes sense that it comes out today as this is the end of Golden Week and now we finally get a look at what to expect in May and June and going forward for Dragalia Lost. So because these are usually pretty big updates and include details on the next version update, I like to just look through these and have a conversation about them, give some thoughts and impressions, talk about the possible implications and speculate as to the new content. So that's what we're going to do today, kind of a casual video. But I also am curious to hear what you think about all of this, if you're seeing it for the first time or if you got to take a look at this uh, yesterday. I'm very curious to hear what you have to say, so leave some comments letting me know what you think. But here we go with What's Ahead Part 4, Director Matsura, always here to talk to us, always here to talk through our issues and our feedback about the game. They have done a pretty good job, a pretty bang up job of doing that so far. So I'm looking forward to uh, seeing what they do in this update. So first we get some information about the event. Pretty much telling us, you know, Fire Emblem Lost Heroes is still happening. If you're brand new to the game, just so you're aware, this is a particularly long event. So if you're feeling a little bit burnt out or feeling like this event has just lasted way too long, I just want you to know this is an abnormally long event. And I think part of it is because they know people are kind of catching up and getting up to speed with their characters and their roster. So don't be too worried about that. The same is true of the whole 10 million Valor thing. That is basically the grindiest they've ever made an event, and most of the good rewards are within 1 million Valor, and that's kind of the normal amount that you would have to reach for an entire event. So this is 10 times that amount, which is pretty crazy, but I think with this being a special type of event we've never seen, those are some of the reasons why. So just be aware of that if you're kind of getting tired of this, as I am getting tired of just playing defensive battles, well, we have some more things to look forward to here, and basically on the 13th, that will end. So depending on your time zone, in my case, it's 1 a.m. on May 14th. If you're on the West Coast, it'll be 11 p.m. on May 13th. We're going to get our new showcase, and the Fire Emblem Lost Hero Showcase is going to end. And we see the featured five star, at least one of them, is going to be Beautician Zardin. Awesome to see this. They mention he's a normally a three-star adventurer. He has a new attire and his skill effects have been tinkered with, which is interesting to hear. So maybe he'll resemble his normal character, but with a different set of mechanics or some wrinkles on those mechanics. His normal character is pretty straightforward. A couple of attacking skills, and I believe he also gets more strength at full HP. He has burn res. So he's a very straightforward character as a three-star. However, Zardin has one of those stories that really turned me around. Zardin was one of the only water characters I had when I first started playing, and basically for the very first raid in the game, Loyalty's Requiem, I used him, I used Elisan, Luther, and I also used um, Myceliera, who was given out for free from that event. And that was my water team for that event, consisting of him as a three star and the others being four stars and some welfare four stars at that. So he served me well in that event and I read his story. He's one of the first stories I read and it's kind of one of the things that hooked me on those stories in Dragalia Lost just because I feel like similar to Xander, he's a character who at a glance you might feel like a bit put off by his personality type and think Zardin is very narcissistic. Once you get to the end of the story, you get some details that totally can change your perspective on him, and that's how I felt personally, so I really like Zardin as a character. And they say, aside from the characters that appear in the main campaign, the supporting cast have a lot of hidden facets and foibles, quirks. Well, suffice to say, there are a lot of interesting characters hanging around, and we want a wide variety of them to appear anew in the future. Awesome, so they're telling us this is not just a one-of thing, maybe some of our four stars even, but definitely I expect that some three stars are going to get this kind of alt shine. It's almost like giving them their own Gala version or special variant. 
And the really great thing is for a four star or a five star, this background art that they have is unique. That is one of my remaining complaints with three stars, despite the buffs they have received, is, you know, they have kind of a generic background art that all of them share when they're promoted, and five stars have a lot of personality in their artwork, so I'm glad Zardin's getting that treatment. Not to mention, being a light blade is a pretty rare combination. We only have Halloween Edward, who obviously isn't available anymore, and he's a natural three star. So Zardin has suddenly made himself potentially very viable just because of that combination. So we'll have to wait and see what his exact kit is, but I'm happy to see this trend of giving some more shine to the existing characters, taking that IP, those original characters that have been created this past year and starting to make alt of them. I really don't mind. I know in some games, like in Fire Emblem Heroes, there was a sense that there were way too many alts, so maybe if we start getting a slowdown in the new characters we get, that could become a concern. But the reason I think that's an issue in a game like that is more that there's all these great original characters from past Fire Emblem games who had never showed up yet. So it felt worse to get more Camillas rather than get one of those characters who had never made an appearance. I don't think that's as much an issue in Dragalia Lost. And Hopefully, if you're not a Zardin fan already, you'll check out his story, and maybe that will tip the scales for you. So on that same day, we're going to get our first event rerun. Resplendent Refrain, the raid, is coming back. We want those of you who started playing recently to be able to enjoy past events, so we're reviving past events in the future. And they're going to revive facility events, too, so don't worry if you missed a facility. Awesome to see Resplendent Refrain come back. This is one of my favorite raids of all time, perhaps my favorite, just because I feel like they did a very good job with making all of the cast in the story relevant to this one, and I think that Elias's personal journey is really powerful. It was really powerful for me, it had some unique music that was only part of this raid, and also the showcase that came out at that time actually featured the characters in the event, and that combination was pretty new at that time. We'd only had one event where that took place before. So the fact that this paired the showcase with the event for the first time and made it very appealing to pull for those characters that added a new mechanic, energy, there's a lot to like about this event. Elias himself is not the strongest light archer, However, he is still a beloved character for many, and because he's one of the weaker light archers, a lot of people have invested into him as their pet projects. They want to make him great despite that, and I think that's awesome. And Marimas, the shadow dragon here, isn't the strongest either. Silk is going to be generally better, especially as you max unbind her, but one of the cutest dragons and has the ability to freeze, which is not seen in shadow, which is also pretty cool. So I'm very happy to see this will be rerun. My prediction, this is kind of baseless, but my prediction is they will actually rerun the banner that was here, except they will add Zardin. Originally, when that banner was run, there were worm prints in the summoning pool. So there was Cupid, there was Lucretia on the banner, and there was Resounding Rendition as one of the worm prints. And there was another worm print too that I'm forgetting, sadly. Uh, we had Vixel and we had Pia, but I think we'll probably get Vixel and Pia with a raid up since people playing the events will probably get excited to try to pull them and we'll get Zardin as kind of the new thing on the showcase and we'll get Lucretia with a raid up and Cupid with a raid up. That is just my prediction just because in the past they've been pretty reluctant to do simultaneous banners and I expect that to kind of continue. I don't necessarily foresee a banner rerun, especially with no worm prints on that banner to kind of balance out the value you're getting. So that's kind of my prediction for that. And if you are a more enfranchised player, you already played this event, my hope is that it starts off and all the rewards that you could have collected last time, you start off from where you left off. So if you only got up to a certain number of emblems, you start off at that same point and get to progress the same way moving forward. Just because after such a long event like this Fire Emblem one, I kind of want to take a break. I would like to not have to play this event too much. I would love it if I just have to go in for my dailies. The boss for this Sabnok is fun to battle against. Of course, now we're going to get some Eleonora versus Sabnok. 
Maybe they could add a higher difficulty as well to the raid, or maybe to the boss battle that's in this, just to give some content for existing players. But to be honest, I wouldn't really mind if there's not much new content, and if you just have to play at a pretty minimum level, just because personally I feel like a break wouldn't be bad right about now. Now after that we get Hybrunhilda's Trial, and this is also going to be geared toward more invested or more enfranchised players. This should help you practice for Hybrunhilda's Trial significantly. It's going to be a lot easier than the normal fight, and it should have a lower might requirement, similar to what we see for Heimengard Sormer's Trial Prelude, where you can pretty much solo it. If you are in a position to beat the normal version, then you can probably solo or take out the Prelude version fairly easily. And this is just giving players another option. If they aren't able to do the High Dragons for their weeklies, they can do these Preludes and start to learn the fight, start to build up their might over time. And the orbs and the succulent dragon fruit that you get from these are not a bad reward and not a bad way to spend excess stamina once you do your weeklies for that week. So glad to see this finally coming out. And we're gonna get some new void battles on May 20th. So it all sounds like they're gonna be alts. Amber Golem, Light, Gushroom Wind, and Violet Ghost Shadow. If I had to guess, this Amber Golem is going to inflict dull, sadly. I think it's gonna be just like the other two golems. Gushroom being wind, it might have the ability to um, proliferate itself, to disperse and transform into multiple shrooms, but maybe they could take a page out of the book of the Frost Hermit and actually give it the copy mechanic instead, I don't know, that might be kind of fun. And the Violet Ghost, Shadow, so the current ghost that we have, the Blazing Ghost, has um, basically ranged resistance. It doesn't take much damage from ranged characters. Maybe this will have proximity resistance, melee resistance, close resistance, and be the opposite, or maybe it'll be the same. But for the most part, these look like just more of what we've come to expect. So I am going to take that time. This will be the time I do most of my monthly void battles, however, just because Whenever they add these new Void Battles, they're going to add new endeavors to go along with it. So if you're not in a rush to collect your Void Rewards, that's probably a good time to go in and do so. Then we get a new Raid event, which it has been a long time. I'm glad we're finally getting a new Raid event. At the end of May, Echoes of Antiquity. It even says it's been some time since there was a Raid boss, and this time we will be fighting this boss, Wind Element, Unfortunately, my pronunciation and my Chinese is not very good, so I think rather than butcher this name, I will ask you for advice as to how to pronounce this in the comments section. I'm not the best with pronunciation in general. A lot of you pointed out to me, uh, Geschpenst. Hopefully that's a little closer because I was saying Geschpenst and it's a German word. I've gotten comments on Julieta where I was saying Julieta and Pele where I think I was first saying hell and I feel like I'm still not pronouncing it properly anyway. However, this looks pretty exciting and apparently from those who are a bit more aware of this, it sounds like it is an adaptation of Journey to the West, which is awesome. This would be kind of the first event that we've had with um, Chinese focused characters and we did get a uh, Lunar New Year event, but it was set in Taiwu, so it was more based on Taiwan, I feel. And we had an event with Japanese New Year, and it was set in Hinamoto, which is kind of a reflection of Japan. So maybe we'll get a new region for this that's kind of a mirror of China, and maybe we'll even get, uh, true to that story, some journeys to India or more uh, to South Asia as well. Perhaps there will be some elements there. Since we have some dragons like Agni with uh, South Asian names. So pretty exciting to see this. And we're going to get another Flame Lance as our adventurer. It's our first Flame Lance since our three star that everybody loves, Elaine. So I am looking forward to this. This character looks very cute with the glasses and the headdress. The lance looks really cool. I hope that we get this particular lance, since it doesn't resemble any existing one to me, as a special weapon in this raid. That'd be sweet. 
I don't know if this will be a stun focused win boss or a sleep focused win boss. It could go either way. We don't have a sleep res wind lancer, so that could be kind of unique if that's the case. That's going to be a pretty cool event, and I'll probably try stream for some of these raids at least. It's something I haven't done in a while, but raids are a good time to do it, so that's kind of what I'm thinking there. Now for Void Poseidon, we're going to get that in the distant future, mid-June. Water attuned, and he wields the Freeze Affliction and a new enemy ability. So basically all these enemy abilities to me are ways of requiring you to craft some new Void weapons just making you participate in the void battle loop and making it so that even if you have a crazy strong wind character you're not beating poseidon very easily unless you either dodge like crazy in some cases or you have one of these special weapons that's kind of the idea with these they're really lock and key to these uh, battles because there's not much use of them outside of those battles like the mechanics in agni are not seen in any other battle right now at least with Zephyr, the dull mechanic does apply to other battles, but Dragon Delay so far does not. So anyway, once we beat Void Poseidon, we'll be able to craft materials, craft weapons, excuse me, for High Mercury. So that'll be probably that'll probably be pretty nice to see. Um, that is still a pretty difficult fight. The entry barrier is low, but the damage requirements are high. So maybe those will have some passives that assist with the damage in that battle. Or maybe even something like Shapeshift Prep, which helps in certain phases if you're not running that on your adventurers, clear through waves or tank some of the waterfalls. So that would be really cool. I'm looking forward to seeing what type of mechanic those weapons have and how Void Poseidon is as a boss. And for the record, it does look like they're going with the original dragons and not the strength dragons like some people had speculated. So the original five five-star dragons were John de Arc, Nidhogg, Poseidon, Agni, and of course Zephyr, who was the first void boss or harder void boss that we got. So after this, we'll probably see Jean de Arc in a void version, which would be awesome. And I think that we will probably see uh, Nidhogg as well, which would also be cool. So after that, one of the bigger updates, the Mercurial Gauntlet. This will be a recurring event. It will pit you against Fafnir Roy III, a pretty easygoing dragon, so don't expect to need too many in-depth tactics. That's already kind of interesting to me. All you need to worry about is attacking and winning before you're defeated yourself. So it sounds like, based on the language of Gauntlet, that Fafnir Roy III is not going to be the only enemy. There's going to be maybe waves of enemies here. If you're victorious, you'll be able to challenge the next level, You'll get rewards monthly based on your progress. It's a simple way to test your team's strength, so if you have a little trouble keeping up with the action of the more intense battles, you'll hopefully enjoy this content. We plan on implementing this mid-June, so try to prepare a team of each element before then. So a couple of things to point out. They really repeat and emphasize this point. They say here, easygoing dragon. Not many in-depth tactics. All you need to do is attack. And then... If you have trouble keeping up with more intense battles, hopefully you'll enjoy this. So I do think this is going to be a beginner-friendly mode. I think it's going to be something laid back. Maybe something where it's almost like your characters just auto-battle or you don't really have to do much effort, you don't have to dodge much, but you get to enjoy seeing your characters fight off against these enemies. That's kind of my expectation of it. But the fact that there's multiple challenges and levels does make me wonder because that's kind of a more competitive element or something that you could be more strategic about so i'm really not sure what this event will fulfill ideally i think it would cater to more enfranchised players and newer players or more casual players alike but we have some time to uh to think about it until it comes out and maybe we'll get a proper preview of it with more details and the fact that they say prepare a team of each element is the other little nugget here since before this, it doesn't really say anything about the levels having different elemental focuses. It just mentions this Fafnir. So I guess there will certainly be some accompanying enemies. And you see these materials here. Some of these gems are not seen in the game so far. This one kind of looks similar to a Sunlight Stone or like a Twinkling Grain, just the coloration. 
But the rest of this, you know, it could just be random loot, or these also could be some new type of material, which may play into another update that I'll mention toward the end of this list. So now the rest of the stuff is mostly quality of life. So we get clear time display. We're going to be able to see that when we clear a quest. And in terms of gameplay, they might use this for future endeavor conditions, which is awesome. Make it very clear what your clear time was, so you don't have to track the clock in the top right corner. You get a very clear indication of that. You can share screens with your friends and compare clear times. Matchmaking with nearby players. If you enable GPS functionality, then you can join nearby players and hopefully have a smoother co-op experience. That'd be kind of interesting, perhaps fun, a way to meet people who are close to you or in close proximity, get a better connection. Crafting feature improvements. So now you'll be able to craft higher tiers of weapons other than the first stage just by look, just by going to that menu and hitting the craft button. You do need the, you know, ingredient materials, but at least you'll be able to do that with one press and you'll be able to use your... It sounds like whetstones as level up material, but not necessarily weapons directly. So either way, that's going to be a big change and big improvement. It's something people were asking about. And crafting is kind of one of those systems that I think the menus are the most confusing to navigate. So I'm glad they're doing that. Then we're going to be able to gift multiple items in the Dragon's Roost. This is another thing people had asked for. Simple change, but should make your dailies even quicker, all the things you want to do in the game every day are just becoming more streamlined, so it's nice to see that. Adventure AI adjustments. In a recent update, we made it so the AI attacks more actively, such as by using Force Strikes. This tip of using Force Strikes, the AI does it now. Hopefully all of you out there are using this too, especially when the boss is in overdrive or if your character has a Force Strike passive. You really want to be using this and you want to make sure you unlock it in your mana circles. But besides that, in the next update, the AI will will move in response to enemy markers. So it's good. The AI was already at a point where it's great. After this update, I could see soloing uh, high dragons being much easier if they're good at dodging because the main challenge with the high dragons right now, in my experience, when uh, soloing high midguard stormer, is basically you just have to preemptively corral your AI because once they lock onto an enemy, especially if they're melee, they're not going to want to run away and dodge. Uh, so you kind of have to preemptively run away to avoid incoming attacks just to make sure they get away in time. So that's a cool change to see. And the other thing that's kind of ambiguous is these five updates are all planned for the end of May, so we'll just have to wait a little longer. But they're adding additional adventure upgrade elements at the end of June. So that's a big mystery. But the fact that this Mercurial Gauntlet is coming out at the end of June as well makes me feel... Well, this is coming out mid-June, sorry. But this makes me feel there may be some connection here. And perhaps some of the materials from that will help us with upgrading our adventurers. I don't really know what they mean by this, but my hope would be some type of like overclassing or unbinding of an adventure once they're at a five star level. Not necessarily to bring them to a six star, just because I feel like, you know, how many stars do you really need? I feel like five is kind of aesthetically pleasing. So I've always been a fan of five stars being the maximum, but you know, adventurers can only reach level 80, whereas weapons, dragons, worm prints can reach level 100. So maybe you could use some type of material to kind of overclass your character and have them be able to reach level 100 or maybe unlock another skill or something. Maybe some type of ability or special effect. And you could do that for some of your favorite characters or the characters you could do it for. Perhaps they could roll them out over time as a way of buffing past adventurers as well. Something like that would be sweet, but that's reading a lot into one little sentence. So... I'm curious, as I said at the beginning of this video, what you think about that, what you think about the Mercurial Gauntlet, what you think about what's ahead for Dragalia Lust Part 4. I look forward to uh, reading all of your comments and hearing what you have to say. I wasn't planning on making this video today, but with all this news that came out, I decided to go ahead and do this. So expect some more content, some guides, another character spotlight later in this week. I hope you look forward to it. 
That's going to do it for this video, though. Thank you so much for watching once again. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you next time.